I want to welcome all of you here to St. Thomas. I'm Professor Tim Lewis, the um, Associate Vice Provost for Global Learning and Strategy, which just means I deal with things that are international. Um, some of you may have study abroad questions. I'll be a good one for that. But I'm also a professor of biology. Um, and in this session, we have another faculty member, a former student and a current student. And what we hope to do is give you a sense of the academic climate, what it's like to be a student or a former student at St. Thomas, or what your professors might be a little bit like. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of like a two minute story of my own experience and then I'll start calling on my panelists and have them introduce themselves and then tell you just a little bit um, about what their point of view is. That'll use up about half our time together and by then you had better be asking questions and we will do our best to field your questions because if you don't ask questions, I ask questions and I bet I don't have the same set of questions as you. I was a full professor at a college in Ohio up to about a decade ago and it was tenured, log house, woods, fantastic job, loved my students, thought there could not be a better place. And I got uh, brought up here to interview for a job and I did exactly what you do. I walked around campus, I talked to students, I talked to some faculty um, and I was absolutely blown away. What was important to me as a professor of biology was what kind of facilities are there for my students? What's the emphasis on research? Would I, would I be able to actually do anything productive with students in class and in labs? And what are the outcomes that students get from this school? Would I be wasting my time here? Or would it be worthwhile? I was so impressed. I left what I thought was my dream job to come here. Those are the kind of things I hope you can learn from some of the panelists here today about why we're at St. Thomas or in Lainey's case, why she used to be at St. Thomas. Um, and Lainey, by the way, heads up, you're gonna go first. Um, and uh, hopefully that'll lead to some questions from you guys about um, anything academic or anything you wanna ask of current student, former student, current faculty. So Lainey, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your experience at St. Thomas. All right, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lainey. Um, I graduated from St. Thomas in 2016, so about four years ago. Um, and in that time, um, I went to, went on to get a graduate degree, a master's degree in conservation biology. Um, I mastered in bio, or I majored in biology here at St. Thomas. Um, then I went on to get my master's and then now I currently work in, um, as a wildlife biologist in the renewable energy industry. Um, and I think one thing that I can really say about my time at St. Thomas was that it really set me up for success um, for my time after being at the school. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, we can kind of touch on some of those things later, but um, definitely, you know, small class sizes were really integral. You get to know your professors and that's really, really important. That's how, you know, I got to know Tim. That's how I got to know um, other professors that I still keep in contact with. Um, and then Tim was really a um, instrumental figure in getting kind of, you know, helping me navigate the um, graduate school world because that's kind of a whole nother ball game once you get to that. Um, and, uh, and then also, um, my connection with Tim helped me to make connections in the industry itself. And, um, that's how I honestly got my current job as well. And so, um, yeah, I, I can't kind of, I don't know, thank St. Thomas enough. Um, it was just the, I don't know, I probably one of the best decisions I've ever made was going to St. Thomas because it got me to be able to do what I love to do every day. So. Thank you. Um, Dr. Carvalho, Corey, my friend, who has been at St. Thomas longer than I have by at least a week or two. Um, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself and tell the students a little bit um, about the, well, about whatever you want, what you think they ought to know. Sounds great. Hi, I'm Corey Carvalho, Dr. Corinne Carvalho. I have been at St. Thomas since 1996, so I think that makes it 24, almost 24 and a half years. Um, I came from an R1 university where I was teaching primarily graduate students. So in some ways, my story is similar to Tim's. 
I came here because I wanted to teach undergraduate students. And I think a lot of the faculty here are here because they love undergraduate teaching. I think that that's so, such an important element of what we do at St. Thomas. Um, I, on the other end, I love teaching first year students. Um, I teach primarily in the core. I think that the core is a great um, way for you to become not just educated in your major, you can go to a trade school and learn how to do certain techniques, for instance, but to become an educated human being who can think critically and act wisely, not just about uh, the technical aspects of your job, but the ethical questions, uh, the cultural issues. Uh, it makes you able to adjust and shift as the world changes. Um, and it makes you a better citizen of this world. Uh, I, I love what I do and I think it is so important. The other thing I want to say is um, having seen R1, it's not really, I think, the best place for undergraduates. Uh, you don't have a lot of interaction with your professors. You end up interacting with graduate students. The teachers who are here are here because they like working with students and there's a lot of opportunities for undergraduate research with your professors. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities for you to explore ways that um, elements, I, I teach in theology, so maybe ways that theology or spirituality intersect with your major or ways that a philosophical discussion makes you think differently about business and business ethics. Um, so you have that, we're, we're large enough to have all sorts of different majors, but small enough where people know each other, where you can make the connections and you can do really interesting and creative things even as an undergraduate. Thanks. I I actually like to describe us as the largest small school you can go to. Um, like other small schools, it's your professor teaching the course, it's class sizes that are small, it's professors who say, Lainey, I didn't see you in class for two days. You feel it okay? Um, and doing research one-on-one -on -one with students, and those are what you get at other small schools, but we're large enough, as Dr. Carvalho said, to have a, we have, almost a hundred different majors and programs, um, numerous minors, I don't even know how many minors. Um, and so you, uh, there was a question about how many intramural sports, sports in the last one, I don't know, but it's a huge number because we have like a large school, the facilities and opportunities of a large school, but giving you the small school classes, which as a teacher is lots of fun. Azan, it's your turn. Tell them who you are, what you're majoring in, and uh, what you think that they might want to know. And I'm noticing so far zero questions coming in. And again, I'm not going to let the panel go without questions. I'd rather be answering your questions than my questions. So please uh, use the Q&A part and ask, the, ask your questions. Ask what's on your mind. It's a rare chance to have a couple faculty, a former student, and a current student at your disposal. Azan. Hi guys, so I'm Azan. Um, I'm a current student at St. Thomas. Uh, I'm in my senior year and I'm a marketing major, so I'm part of the Opus College of Business. Um, I have a bit of a unique experience because I'm also a transfer student, so I had the experience of being um, at two separate community colleges before I came to St. Thomas. Um, as far as the academic part of St. Thomas, you know, Tim kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, the biggest thing for me was you know, it has the facilities of a large school. You go on campus and you're honestly immediately blown away by, for me, even just how beautiful the buildings are, um, as well as, you know, all the resources that students have. But the small class sizes were really what clinched uh, St. Thomas for me, um, because you're really able to see the professor's passion in their, in their subject come out. And it, it also inspires you to be passionate about that subject, even if it's just for a semester and unrelated to your major, you're still having a really fun time and learning a lot, which is 100% um, the reason that I go to St. Thomas. Good, thanks. Um, I'm wondering, Lainey and Azan, if you can talk a little bit about workload. Uh, what does, you know, how many classes do you take at once and what's that like for you guys? Sure, I can kind of um, start it off. So I was a science major. Um, I generally take about four classes um, per semester, so 16 credits. I think that's still probably accurate. <laughs> um, 
And uh, the way that I kind of, and, and I, I would say your science advisors, if you are kind of thinking about going that route, because there is a little bit more time investment um, because you have labs on top of um, some of the time that, um, you know, you have labs in, in addition to your actual uh, class time. Um, and the good thing about having, you know, a science specific advisor um, is that they'll be able to help you um, kind of navigate, you know, balancing your science courses with your core courses and then also maybe your minor courses so that you're not taking like four labs at once. You would never want to do that. Um, so that's another thing. Um, the advice, you know, working with your advisor will be crucial um, to making sure that you don't overbook yourself. Um, and then the other thing that's really awesome about St. Thomas is that you can take um, a class over J term and you can actually then, you know, depending on what you need to get done, um, you can maybe have a smaller workload during a hard semester. So I did that a few times as well, where I um, took like a, stat, a stats course in January and I got that out of the way. And then I only had to take three courses in the spring when I was taking like organic chemistry or something like that, something a little bit um, more difficult. So. Is that yeah, um, workload. That's an uh, that's an interesting question. So you know, I uh, I agree with Lainey that I've been taking four four courses a semester, uh, which is sixteen credits. Um, and one of the biggest components for that for me was um, making sure that I didn't have all really rigorous courses. You know, maybe you'll have one tough course, tough course, one course relating to your major, and then um, you know, like other courses that are unrelated to your major. Um, and, you know, maybe a little bit easier in terms of just content to go through. And that makes uh, your semester a lot easier. And that way, when you're learning of a broad variety of subjects, you don't get too uh, burnt out on one specific thing. You know, if I had all marketing courses, that would be, you know, kind of an overload as far as like just jumping into the business realm. So um, it's really important to work with your advisor um, to make sure that your course load is something that you can handle. Um, another important aspect is that you can talk to your professors always, you know, they're always willing to reach out um, and talk to you and help you in any way that you need. And um, I would say the earlier, the better. If you feel like you're struggling in a subject for whatever reason, reach out to them early in the semester rather than waiting later and, and you know, kind of coming to them final week. That's not going to help you very much. Um, another important subject, though, is that once you declare your major, you do get a faculty advisor. And I believe that that's the case for all majors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they'll have experience in the industry as well as they'll know the best way to get you to your degree while not uh, overloading you. Good. Thanks. We do have a couple of questions now starting in. Um, and the first question is probably one that um, I'll take handle. If a student is homeschooled and does not receive grades or test scores, does it affect the classes they are allowed to take or um, if they are accepted to the school? Um, it's a good question. First of all, we are test optional, meaning that nobody has to take the entry tests. What happens on courses where there is a content specific requirement like math, there is a math placement test that everybody takes, whether uh, they receive tests back or receive grades or not uh, in their high school environment. Um, language is the same way. There's uh, content area specific questions or tests that you take to get your placement. So that doesn't matter. Um, the admissions program, uh, they could t the admissions folks can give you more detail about how they weigh people who come in with grades that are different or, or not grades from homeschooled. But you look at the whole package when you're looking to admit somebody. You don't just look at GPA ever. You, you wouldn't just look at tests ever. You look at letters of recommendation. You look at what they did. You look at other evidence of their accomplishments. So it's, we definitely admit students who come in from homeschooled environments um, and the, the whole admissions process is used to evaluate people holistically. It's not, it doesn't determine what classes you can take and anyone who's got those prerequisite classes would be, have to show in a content area on a placement test anyway. Um, you would, the academic counseling program would work carefully with what your math background was, what your science background might be or your language background, et cetera, to figure out placement. So not at all a problem. Um, and then the next one, I don't, uh, the next one in line is um, the GHR Fellows, which I believe is in the business area. Azan, do you know anything about the GHR Fellows? 
Uh, I don't actually. I'm gonna beg off on one of our admit. Corey, you do you? No, I'm just thinking. I think uh, uh, financial aid is next, and that would be a great place. Yeah, I that have the information. Great, but Chris just came online, and Chris is gonna answer Yay! the question. Yes. Um, so our GHR Fellows Program is uh, it's one of our our business scholarship programs. Uh, for so for those who are not familiar with that, that's what that is. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to your admissions counselor with specific questions about the GHR Fellows Program, just because it, it is kind of an intricate program. Um, so something that we can cover a little bit more in detail, um, but love that there's questions about scholarships. And we do have financial aid coming up next. Um, so they should hopefully be able to touch on some things there as well. And I know it includes a study abroad component, so I'm very supportive of that. Um, uh, can anyone talk about the physical science majors? Well, being a phys depending on your definition of physical sciences, if you're limiting it to physics and geology, for example, or if you're talking um, about all the sciences outside biology, chemistry, biochemistry, physics, um, geology, depending on your definition of physical sciences, easy enough to do. The, the programs are really strong. The university invests an enormous amount of money in undergraduate science experiences. That means first rate labs, means research experiences and opportunities, means small classes with even smaller lab sizes. So we have an ex excellent geology program. We have an excellent physics program. We have an uh, excellent chemistry program, excellent biochemistry. And one of the ways to, to tell is physically to walk through and look at labs, take pictures, this is what I encourage visiting students to do. Take pictures of the labs that students learn in, not the research labs, the labs students learn in and compare them one school to the next. I think you'll be really impressed. In some ways, it's like walking into a kitchen. You can tell by the tools they have available what kind of work they do and if they're serious about it. And again, it's the teaching ones you wanna see. Everybody's got great research labs anywhere you go. Those are often grant funded. You need to look at the teaching labs. So they have excellent programs. You start off with, in the sciences, whether it's biology or one of the other sciences, you start off with math and chemistry. And then if you're going on the physics route or geology route, you take physics, and you often, if you're in geology, take an intro geology course at the same time in your first two semesters. The question is about chemistry. Um, it was clarified in the chat. Oh, very cool. Um, so chemistry, they start with the gen chem sequence, which is uh, a year of general chemistry and then a year of organic chemistry. Very strong programs, excellent faculty. And what's really cool is in our second year pro program in Rome, the Fall and Power program, we have an organic chemistry professor who goes there so that our science students can take can continue their science major and take a semester in Rome by taking organic chemistry in Rome with one of our own faculty. Fantastic faculty, fantastic programs, 100 percent or 99 point some percent placement because chem majors are in high demand um, and we have excellent programs and they just love to brag about that because their students go on to excellent graduate programs and excellent jobs even at the after the undergraduate level. Um, is it easy to change a major? I'll let Dr. Cavallo, Azan, you've changed. Uh, go ahead, answer away. Uh, yeah, so I was initially um, a computer science major uh, for two years before I switched to marketing, um, which is, you know, a whole other discipline. And, uh, you know, the reason behind that was because I was able to get some personal experience, which, you know, tuned me from one way to another. But um, I would say it is easy to change majors. Um, in some cases, it obviously depends on how far you're going from one program to another. Um, but another thing that's important to know is that you don't have to declare your major so soon. It's not such a, you know, burden on you. I would recommend taking at the very minimum um, a first year um, of courses before you start to um, think seriously about where you want to be. It's not um, one of those things that as soon as you're admitted, you're like, you know, I have to choose what I'm doing right now. That's not the case. Feel things out, um, you know, talk to your advisor. And nine times out of 10, if you are changing from uh, one major to another, there are at least a handful of courses that um, transfer from one side to another. And especially if you're changing from something that's related. So if I went from you know, marketing to finance or accounting, 
then there are at least a good deal of courses that I would share with that program. Corey, do you want to add anything about major changes? No, I, I think that Azan mentioned it already. That there are certain majors, of course, that are more sequenced. Um, and so it might add some time onto your program. Um, if you are going to a highly sequenced program like engineering, um, you might have missed some uh, basic um, courses that, that you'll, you'll need to take. Um, the, the, there's not a separate admission into each uh, major, so that maybe that's where this question is coming from. Um, we do not currently have admission to the major uh, to a great extent. Social work has a very small one. Um, once we start nursing, we probably will for nursing, but that's just because of space uh, issues. Um, and so otherwise it's, uh, administratively easy, but work with your advisor, especially in the beginning, if you know you're debating between two, your advisor can help you choose courses that will give you the maximum flexibility and also uh, give you the information you need to make that decision. Is the core different? That it, do a one sentence what the core is and is the core different between engineering and chemistry and uh, philosophy? So our general core is the same um, for no matter what your major is. And uh, for the most part, it's one course in several different academic areas. Um, and then uh, we have integrating humanities, two courses in that where you uh, take courses that were the, in the humanities that integrate with uh, other disciplines. Uh, so it's interdisciplinary. And then you also have a set of three courses that you have to take outside of your major. Um, you can either do it as a minor, as a second major, or as um, a series of courses that you and your advisor map out for you that work for your own professional goals. Um, so there's room in there to have that exploration, if you will, and to, if there's a course that you take that doesn't count, quote unquote, within a new major, it may, you may be able to put it into one of those other categories so that it's counting for something else. And uh, we're gonna, there's a follow-up question to what you were just talking about. Why is it necessary for students to take compulsory courses, and I'm assuming they mean the um, core there, compulsory courses at St. Thomas? Um, it's our educational philosophy. Did you want me to answer that? I'm just, I just went ahead, sorry. <laughs> It's our, it, you know, there are universities where you don't, um, where, where students uh, pick and choose. Uh, the University of Santa Cruz is one of the kind of parade examples, although they recently changed from having no core to having some core courses. Um, with our educational philosophy, we do have uh, within our uh, tradition an idea that um, the humanities in particular provide a, uh, that broad basis of being an educated professional. Um, the ability to write, the ability to uh, use logical reasoning, the ability to have some math literacy, the ability to have some science literacy, no matter what it is, uh, and it, you know, experience in trying to learn another language. Um, you can't be, a great worker in the workforce these days without those skills. Um, and the way those courses are taught are taught with the recognition that we're not teaching majors, we're teaching people to think about those topics as the, from that perspective of an educated citizen of the world. Yeah. I would toss in the, in a global world, you're not going to understand other cultures, other people, unless you have a broader exposure to cultures and people, and that happens in those core courses. Um, uh, Zahn or Lainey, do you want to say anything about those or uh, about the core courses or your experience in those courses? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, I would say that, honestly, you know, while there might be an initial kind of feeling of, oh, man, you know, they're not related to my major, why do I have to do this kind of thing? 100% you'll enjoy them. Honestly, you'll get to meet some amazing professors, you'll meet more of your cohort um, outside of your major, and so you'll get to know more people, which is always important. Um, you'll get the ability to network. And like Tim said, on a larger scale, it, it rounds out your skills and it makes you, um, you know, a little bit more uh, global, like he, you know, like he likes to say. So 
I think that it really does help round you out um, and it gives you a perspective on lots of different things um, outside of your major so that, you know, even if let's say, you know, your industry shifts a little bit that you still have at least a little bit of experience there, you can kind of know what you're talking about and keep up. Lainey, did you want to toss anything in or not? Um, I think it's been pretty well covered. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it helps with burnout too. I mean, honestly, if you're just taking science or engineering or business classes purely and that's it. Um, yeah, I think it's just a really nice break as well. Um, and definitely, um, I mean, like I took, I think a Chinese painting course, um, not an, I didn't actually do Chinese painting. It was an art history, um, course. And it was, it was fascinating. I almost ended up majoring in um, art history and I didn't end up doing it, but um, it was, you know, it just really opens your eyes to some, something completely different potentially. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Do you know what the, uh, I, this is a rhetorical question because you guys have heard me say this before. Do you know what the number one major of incoming students is? Undecided. Um, and lots of students change their major oftentimes because of those courses that they took and they went, oh, I didn't even know that was a field of study. So we're, all, we're gonna, there's a, one about other majors in a second, but I've been ignoring the engineering one for a minute. Um, any info you have about the engineering program and facilities? Again, I would tell you, take your camera because they have fab, fabulous facilities. Go over to um, the, the South Campus, which is just across um, Creighton Avenue and uh, go, to, go in and look at the engineering facilities. They're fantastic. They're very student-oriented labs with an emphasis on student design. In fact, the senior design course can be taken in South America or in Jordan, so uh, in um, Argentina or in Jordan, and, um, and where students actually design uh, and solve real world engineering problems to help people uh, live sustainable lives in their countries. So it's a fantastic program. It's the second largest program in the state of Minnesota after the University of Minnesota. It is the fastest growing program. The number of students has been skyrocketing. Um, it's more than, way more than doubled in the time I've been here and I've only been here about a decade. It's a fantastic program, innovative dean, fantastic faculty, you go walk in there and just wander in and meet some of those faculty, you'll be very impressed. Um, really good outcomes. And I'm trying to remember the number and the admissions can correct me when I state it wrong. I think they were like 35 in the country for engineering schools. It was a really high number in engineering schools. Um, Chris is coming on. Chris is going to give us the number. Yeah, I think you, you are correct with that 35 number ranked. Um, you know, yeah, for sure. I think 35th in the nation for engineering programs. So good really good. Um, we'll take that one as done. And uh, oh, I just got a note from Amanda Hager. It's number 33, not number 35. So even better than good. So there. Thank you, Amanda. Um, can I, uh, there, uh, there was a, one that disappeared, uh, but I might have just hit disappear. It was about a criminal justice major. Um, and do we have a criminal justice major? And they just changed, the answer is yes, but they just changed their name, didn't they? I thought I just got, was told, um, okay, Chris, come on back. Did they, did, did, uh, did they change it? Or is it still, oh, wait, wait, Amanda says it's criminal justice and double major was the question, right? But did they change their name? Just, uh, I thought. Not, not that I've okay. heard. So um, yes, we have criminal justice. I think and, they changed departments. Oh. It, they're, they're in a different, they're not within sociology. Oh, okay. So that's not going to be, uh, that's not going to fit the question. Yes we, yes, we have criminal justice as a major. and We have good faculty involved in that. And yes, you can double major. Some majors are easier than others um, to double major in. Um, and I recommend it when it fits your passions. I don't recommend them for uh, just doing it for the, you know, because I'm trying to look good. A lot of pre-health students would ask me, should I do this because it'll look good to the medical schools? What looks good to graduate programs, what looks good to employers, what looks good to medical schools, what looks good to anywhere you're going is that you did something for reasons that were important to you and not to check boxes. Find your passion, pursue your passion. If that is a double major, you bet. You can even design your own major. There's some constraints on what you can do, but yes, double majors and, and um, 
self-made majors are perfectly possible. We have one minute left. Um, Lainey and Azan, same question as yesterday. What would you tell, Lainey, you're gonna go first. Um, uh, can, what would you tell self from their, their time? Uh, what could you go back and say, this is what I knew, learned about St. Thomas. I wish I'd have known it when I was looking at schools. Um, I think that it's something we've touched on a little bit already, but I think that, um, and I'm changing my answer from yesterday. <laughs> I, so I would say the one thing I would have liked to know or to, to tell myself would be to not worry so much about having it all figured out right when I started. Um, I think that I put a lot of pressure on myself to know what major, have all my classes lined up, you know, <laughs> I don't know, just like have it all figured out. You need to know right now. No, like take the time, like Azan was saying, to really explore those classes. Um, take something interesting for your core. Like don't think of it as just tech checking a box. Um, you know, you don't have to take like just basic theology. You can explore, you can take, you know, Buddhist philosophy or something like that instead. Um, we have a lot of, I don't know if that's an, a specific course, but I'm just saying like, there's a lot of options out there. And um, I, I think I just would have, yeah, wish that I would have let myself be a little bit more flexible with those and maybe um, have a little bit more of an open mind going into to college. Good, thanks. Azan, 30 seconds. Um, similar answer to yesterday, I would say that uh, reaching out and trying to be a part of the community at St. Thomas, which is incredibly easy, um, is so much fun. And it's just a great place to be. Some fantastic people. Um, you'll learn amazing things. You'll make some great friends, great connections even that'll help you get a job once you graduate. Um, and overall, just being a part of the St. Thomas community is uh, just a lot of fun and really important. So on behalf of the group here, thank you so much for your time with us. Uh, love having you here. Make sure you wander around, get to see the place um, and get your questions answered. It's an exciting time. Thanks.